it is time for us to hit STP, the spanning tree protocol, and a couple of hours, I believe, here of lecture and labs, plenty of labs coming up. We do have some very important theory to cover first and some walkthroughs. And first, we need to discuss why we need STP to begin with. You know, whether we're at layer two or layer three, and that's, of course, switching at layer two, routing at layer three, we love redundancy. Absolutely love it. You know, we've got to have a backup path because a single point of failure for anything in today's networks, it's just not acceptable. We can't have a path go down between point A and point B and there be no other path to get there. We just can't have that. Now, with that in mind, there are really important differences between L2 redundancy and L3 redundancy. Now, if you haven't worked with a routing protocol yet, no worries, we're definitely gonna take care of that later in this section or in this course. But with layer three routing protocols, and I know you've worked with RIP now, but not a ton of OSPF and EIGRP, these protocols allow us to use secondary paths in addition to the primary paths, because there will always be a better path or a best path. But we have these other valid paths that are just sitting there. Well, layer three routing protocols, they allow us to use those secondary paths in addition to the primary paths, making equal cost load balancing and unequal cost load balancing possible. And if you're not familiar with those terms, you're okay. You will see them in action later. The point is, is that layer three routing protocols really encourage use of secondary paths. And with routing, as you'll see, we want to use as many of those paths as is feasible. Now at layer two, our redundant paths, our backup paths, if you will, they need to be ready for action in case the primary path fails, in case a port along that path goes bad. But they are not by default going to be used in addition to the primary path. STP is going to discover a loop-free path, the best loop-free path, and then choose that path for use. And the other paths are just kind of on standby in case something goes wrong. What happens? is that STP is going to block ports on the valid but less desirable paths. And it, really, those paths are in standby. And anything, you know, a cable goes loose, an actual port goes bad along that primary path, STP realizes that and says, hey, wait a minute, i got to start bringing some ports out of what we call blocking mode because now we need to use this backup path. Now, I've kind of used the terms, you know, best path and, you know, you know less desirable path. Well, where does that come from? What happens is that STP analyzes port speeds, and it would do so in this network, as this is a lot of redundancy. It doesn't matter which switch needs to send frames to which switch. We have several different paths for them to get there. And STP would analyze this and say, okay, here are here's the best path to get from A to B, or to send frames from here to point B, and I'll put the other ports in blocking mode so that we have one loop-free path. And STP, again, would determine not only which port should be open, but which ones will be closed. And also, in case a currently open port goes down or some other problem arises, STP says, okay, here's the next port that should be open. Switching loops. You know, that's what STP helps us avoid, switching loops. And it works so well that plenty of networks do not even fine-tune spanning tree protocol. You know, I hate to just say small network or medium-sized network because these are, you know, pretty relative terms. But at a lot of places, you know, just four or five switches, maybe, you know, maybe a few more. It's like, eh, they don't even fine-tune STP because it works so well. And it helps them avoid switching loops. Now, switching loops, and I'll remind you of this more than once, happen at layer two of the OSI model. Because when we're in the exam room, we're in there to what? We're in there to win. We're in there to score points, not give them away. If Cisco is asking us a question about a switching loop or an L2 loop, they're talking about spanning tree protocol, as opposed to routing loops, which we will discuss in the routing section. But just watch that. It's a big difference, switching loops and routing loops. We're talking about switching loops here. And what we mean is, going back to our four switch network here, if the switch in the upper left-hand corner wanted to send frames to the switch in the lower right-hand corner, you know, STP will give it one path to do so. Because if STP didn't do that, the frames could be sent to one switch, which then sends them to another switch, which then sends them back to the original sender. Or the two switches could just start sending the frames back and forth to each other. And I'll actually show you, when we get to routing loops, I'll actually show you what one looks like. 
uh, and it's uh, it's pretty gnarly to use an ancient word, but it's just a real mess because what happens is the switches keep going back, excuse me, the frames keep going back and forth between different switches, but they never get to their destination. So if that sounds bad, that's because it is. And switching loops cause serious issues. Some are just annoying, but some are highly critical. Now, the thing is the MAC address table entries are going to continually change, and we're going to do a walkthrough on that. You're going to see exactly what I mean. And some or all of the frames sent to point B will never get there. So what happens also with these MAC address table entry changes is we end up with a lot of frame flooding. So there's an unnecessary strain put on the switch CPUs right there. There's a larger chance of what we call a broadcast storm, where our switches just end up getting pounded with broadcasts that are being forwarded and forwarded and forwarded and forwarded because of these changes to the MAC address table, and you just end up with more and more and more broadcasts. And it gets to the point where the switches literally can't do their job of switching legitimate traffic, legitimate frames, because they're handling so many of the broadcast frames. And then finally, if all that weren't bad enough, there's a lot of wasted bandwidth with a switching loop. You're just sucking up bandwidth unnecessarily. Now again, here's a quick reminder about routing loops and switching loops. I'm not gonna hit you over the head with that again. Layer two is switching loops, layer three is routing loops. Okay, a small hit there, but do watch that on exam day. And what happens here, and I've mentioned this before, but we're gonna go into a little more detail here. Because if a problem arises with an open port, STP runs what we call the spanning tree algorithm and it's going to recalculate the available paths and determine which port should be open to compensate for the problematic port or ports. You know, you could have somebody yank a cable out and all of a sudden, you know, what do you got? You got a mess. Well, STP will start bringing these ports that were not being used from blocking mode into forwarding mode, which is again going to leave one loop-free path between any two endpoints in our switching network. Now, why did I mention that when I just mentioned it two minutes ago? Well, here's why. There are intermediate stages that are built into the blocking to forwarding move that help guard against switching loops forming during the transition. And we're going to cover all of these port modes in depth in this section. But what I want to call to your attention now is with very rare exception, and, and there's usually one, there's always one in networking, who am I kidding? But as a rule, ports are not going to go from blocking to forwarding just like that, you know, in half a second. It's not going to happen because if they did, let's say that we had what we call a flapping link. And a flapping link can be caused by several different things. But what it is, it's just a link that is up one moment and down the next. Up one moment, down the next. Maybe you've got a port that's shorting out. Maybe you've got a bad cable. And it's fine for one minute and then it goes down for five seconds. Then it comes back up. Well, the thing is, if that continues to happen, STP is going to compensate for it, but you don't want STP bringing those blocked ports into forwarding mode just like that. Because if that if the STP did that, and then that link suddenly comes back up, it just keeps flapping, then you have a little bit of a problem, and you have the danger of a switching loop. So when we talk about these modes and later the STP timers, these things are there for a reason. They're not just there to memorize for the exam. Please trust me on that. Uh, they are there for a purpose, and that is to prevent switching loops from forming. Now, that's all fine, you say, but what about these redundant paths? You know, if you're like me, you know, maybe you're a little hard-headed. Maybe you get told theory, because this happens to me. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you know, I get told I can't do something. I think this just comes from, you know, my childhood, and, you know, my mom said I was that way then. It's like, you can't, don't do that. Why not? Why can't I do that? Well, why can't I use every single path from A to B for switching? Uh, you know, like we do for routing. Why can't I use all the paths? Well, what we'll do when we come back is have a walkthrough in a network where STP is not in use. And you'll see exactly what I mean. And that is coming up next.